Hey, Joe, we keep talking about the summer and, and now it's fall. It's uh, we got some football going on and it sounds like the NFL is uh, the only only game in town. But we are fortunate here uh, living in the southeast, uh, having football as well. So which one uh, do, do you miss the most? Do you, are you a college football, a pro football, neither, both? You know, I Growing up in Wisconsin, you know, you can't help but be a Packer fan. So, you know, uh, I, I've got the itch, but, you know, we'll see how it goes this year. Um, it's hard to be a Packer fan. Uh, you know, in South Carolina, I live just across the border, of course. But uh, there's, there's a few of us around, you know. Uh, my neighbor is just a, a enthusiast for Clemson. So I've been sucked into that vortex. Um, he'll have well, pre-COVID, obviously. Last year, he would have, you know, parties and gatherings at his house, and I'd go over and watch. Uh, they reminded me of Packer fans. They're, they're that enthusiastic. I'll just put it that way. Especially when they get some of that, uh, that uh, lubricating fluid in them. You know what I'm talking about? <laughs> Any uh, Packer traditions that you have, whether you're having you're watching a game at home or going to a game or food, what's – What's kind of Packer Nation kind of look like? You know, uh, back in the day when uh, lived there, we had a lot of friends that were all Packer fans, and we'd get together on Sundays for barbecue and, you know, the normal stuff. Cheese curds, of course, you got to have cheese curds, wearing your cheese hat, uh, those sorts of things. But for me, actually, Mike, I was such a fanatical fan. I didn't want anybody around me. I had to, cause I was just too emotional. <laughs> true but fan, true it, fan. Yeah. Life has changed, man. I, you know, uh, I, I watch from afar now. I don't get too involved, but I, I do miss it. I love the feeling of fall coming around for sure. Yeah. It's uh, we've had a little bit of a break in the, in the weather, so to speak, uh, but also going back to school. So, you know, uh, we've got a great guest in talking about going back to school. Right. Uh, so who, who do we have on the, on the show for today? Well, we're thrilled to have David Kim on the show from CPCC. Uh, David is a 25-year veteran of technology IT. Um, he spent about 17 years now, I think, at CPCC, a great institution. I had a chance to meet some of the, the folks at CPCC earlier before COVID and spent some time on one of their campuses um, and uh, really had a phenomenal experience. Beautiful campus, uh, the particular one that I was at. Uh, with a water scene in the backdrop and beautiful uh, forests and trees. And, uh, you know, my, I don't remember going to school and have it being so nice. But, uh, David, it's great to have you on. What about your background did I miss that you'd like to highlight for us today? Well, first, I want to thank uh, both you and uh, Mike for having me here. It's exciting to be uh, on this show, if I can call it that. Um, I think you hit it pretty much on it, on the nail uh, as far as my background. I would say that uh, all that actually 28 years, I just uh, recounted all the numbers. And uh, it's amazing that I've been in the particular industry of both IT and higher education. So I guess that's a passion of mine, both technology and education. So very much enjoy it. Yeah, you know, I actually did the math myself, but I don't typically like to mention it because some people get a little nervous about it. <laughs> I've 42 years for me, you know, like, okay. You know, I'm not hiding it anymore. It's just I'm an old guy. But uh, you've been through quite a bit at CPCC. And I think, you know, obviously with COVID-19 uh, and school just back in session, you've probably been faced with some unique challenges. Can you tell us a little bit about how you've had to sort of respond to this uh, particular crisis? Yes, absolutely. You know, it's, it's a really unfortunate situation for all of us to be in COVID, but I think there's a, a very similar issues that we're all faced with. But specific for us, I want to uh, highlight first and foremost that, you know, with Central Piedmont, we're really about the community. So I love the name when we say we are a community in college. And so we recognize uh, that, you know, we have a, a incredible diversity in terms of our, our students. So we, we serve students, whether they're from high school age to senior citizens. And so uh, we have the challenges in terms of uh, diversity as well, too. So I think the greatest challenge we have is that uh, many of our students are uh, have a social economic uh, status where they may not have the technology, whether it be the, the laptop or the, probably the biggest thing is internet connectivity. And so as we transition to COVID, where many of us are now at home trying to figure out how do we work and then how do we take classes, uh, really communicating first and foremost with students who already are challenged with this, not having any technology is one of the biggest things that we're faced with. 
but how do we make sure that we have a, a equivalent or quali quality of education for these students without these particular barriers? So one of the things that we recognize is that we had to reach out to these students and then um, find out how many of them really needed uh, a laptop or MiFi. And so one of the first things that we did in the, in the, as we entered in March was really handed out a lot of laptops and MiFi so that they have that connectivity so they can continue their education. That's, um, that's uh, an amazing story. I, I'm sure it's still unfolding. Um, when did classes start again? Uh, so classes began a little over a week ago now. So we had to actually um, uh, start earlier this, this year by week because of, of, of the planned RNC. So we knew that RNC uh, was about to happen and we planned on closing our campus during that time frame. And as of course we know that that all changed as well too. So it, it was a challenge, but yes, uh, compared to all their schools, we started a week in advance, so. Yeah, it's it's interesting to see how um, both the RNC and DNC have uh, shifted and uh, from mo the most part uh, that I've heard, uh, you know, people have been pretty pleased with both uh, conventions so far. Um, I'm, I'm part of the Business Relations Management Institute and their annual conference is happening all week this week. and. Uh, there, there's, they've had the largest number of attendees ever. And what's been fun is you get to meet people from all over the globe, from you know, Europe and uh, South Africa and, and, and um, just points all over uh, the globe. And it's been fun. That's something that you know, wouldn't have happened in the, if, if they had followed, uh, follow, followed through with their normal program of having an event here in Boston. Um, so, you know, I, th I think you, you said something that was interesting. Um, you, you have people from all walks of life and from various parts of their journey. Um, how have you engaged with the community on that front and, and with businesses? Are, are you tailoring programs to the specific needs that they have? Yes, absolutely. So one of the, thing, the things that is very important for us is that uh, we recognize our community at large. So first and foremost, we have to recognize where are our students, um, especially those who are coming through the ranks from high school when they're graduating, trying to understand what their needs are. But we get a lot of calls, uh, whether it be from the students or perhaps even the parents saying, okay, what are job opportunities that's out there? It's, it's great to figure out a major, but we wanna be sure that once we, we get a degree that there is a job for me. So it's important to also kind of capture the businesses around us and understand uh, what kind of jobs is related to a program that we offer as well. So we do reach out to a lot of our businesses. We also have uh, data analytics. You know, we all try to be data driven to understand what jobs are out there, what are the key skills that we require. But I, I would say the most important thing is the conversation we're having with each of the businesses and trying to reach out. Uh, for instance, uh, I think recently with the whole COVID, we had to reach out to the healthcare industry. As we know, they were greatly impacted. And so we had to understand what are the needs. And so we quickly had to figure out what do we need to do to accelerate perhaps uh, some of the programs so that we can get students who are near completion so they can go out into the field and, and support or perhaps not really uh, accelerate in that regards, but perhaps how do, they, how do we work with them so that they can actually serve in the healthcare while they're continuing to finish their education. So yes, absolutely. We want to reach out to the businesses around us and, and, and tailor the courses for them. And that's interesting because, um, you know, you could do a lot virtually and we were talking about this before the, the show started. There's certain skills that you can't learn virtually, like how do you draw blood uh, you know, virtually? Maybe you could do that. I don't know. I, I certainly wouldn't want, uh, I loved your story about, you know, <laughs> taking a virtual class and then having, you know, a doctor, you know, try, try to take your blood or a nurse take your blood for the first time after taking an online class. I, I don't know if I'd want to be that first person. But what, what sort of unique challenges has that presented from a technology vantage point and how have you had to sort of respond to those sorts of things? So uh, it, you just uh, touch on it really about how do we give the hands-on experience right now? Um, it, it's really a difficult thing. So we've actually reached out to our students trying to figure out where are they? It's important for us to hear from our students as well in terms of do they want to come on campus? Do they want to do it virtually? And, and I think for all of us, we're on the same boat. Everyone has different feelings about it from one end to the other uh, on the spectrum. And, and so uh, we have to figure out now from a technology standpoint, how can we give as much of the education from a virtual standpoint? 
And then how do we bring them on campus uh, to give them that hands-on experience? So what's interesting is that we talked about that. I, I was surprised about three years ago, I was thinking, there's no way we can have uh, kind of a virtual welding, for instance, right? But soon I uh, found out uh, three years ago that we have actually uh, VR where you, we do simulate uh, welding and it, it's been fantastic, but it still doesn't take away that you have to have that hands on experience because uh, you, you want to give them the ability to not have fear when they first started, but you also don't want to take away complete fear because when you actually do the welding, you get to experience the spark and the heat and all those things. And so it, it's still very important, no matter how much we do to put, give them a virtual experience. So we're doing a lot of uh, direction towards VR and all that. Well, you can never take away from the hands-on experience. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's the, you know, and Mike and I have talked about this, uh, over the course of other podcasts, but, you know, I, I do think that there is a place for virtual and I think we're learning about, you know, what makes sense, but I, uh, that human sort of interaction, uh, especially in the areas that you're talking about are so vitally important. And I can't wait for uh, a vaccine to show up because it's getting, uh, I think it's uh, stressing a lot of people out. Um, and, you know, I, I think, uh, in your, in your world, uh, providing the technology backbone for CPCC. What sort of big changes have you seen and how they accelerated, uh, especially now in the, in the face of COVID-19? So uh, I would say two things, one of which is that uh, there is a lot of uh, similar things that we have in place, right? So we have to ramp up a lot of what we call the learning management system where we give the uh, virtual classroom experience. And so we had to make sure that we ramp up a lot of those things. Surprising enough, I think the biggest thing is uh, that uh, one of the things that we were surprised by, not just by our students, but also our employees, and I have a feeling that that's been true with all our industries, because as I talk to other CIOs uh, from other industries, we're faced with the same thing, is that uh, it's amazing to find out that how we were not prepared for this moment, right? So perhaps in the IT industry about working virtually, um, and so... Uh, people have asked me, how do you manage in a virtual environment? And it's amazing that people have not really thought through that completely. And so uh, I'll give you an example. Uh, we had a lot of our uh, faculty and staff uh, who simply because they had gotten accustomed to the fact that we set the environment in, in, on the campus, uh, that they didn't have these larger monitors. And so when they take it home, we found out that they didn't realize that they couldn't hook it up to their, their computer, that there are different cables, for instance. Um, and so uh, it, as simple as that is that we've taken that for granted in a way because that's been prepared for them. But when we went to the virtual and when we had to go immediately into the virtual, uh, we soon realized that there is this baseline that we had to prepare for. So for me, it's, it's less about the technology. It was really about the soft points, the, the touch points that we had to really help people really shift uh, and prepare for actually to be in this particular environment. That's probably the greatest challenge. I wanna say the other thing that from a student perspective is that as I mentioned before, is that we have different walks of life uh, in our community. And so what we've also done is that we've gotten so dependent on technology. So. Uh, for instance, our uh, formal means of communication is email. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we found out that there are many students who don't have laptops or don't have uh, MiFi's. And suddenly, when we're still using primarily email for communication, we're finding that the people who really need the resources, we're not communicating because they can't receive it. And so that's, we have to rethink now, just on a non-technology basis, how do we reach these uh, students as well too. Yeah, and, and is, is that a, a fairly sizable percent of your student base that you know has the, um, or your challenge from that standpoint, and, and you need to find these alternative methods? Is that a um, twenty percent of the staff of the student body, or, or what? What percent is that? Uh, so uh, I want to say that uh, since March, we handed out about eleven hundred laptops and about wow. a little over eight hundred MiFi's at this point. Um, that is that is a lower percentage in, in my mind. So we serve uh, on a given semester. I want to say about eighteen. I think we have about eighteen thousand uh, okay. students that we're serving. So from that regard, it's a smaller percentage. Um, 
So it, it's fairly small, but I think it's still very important. Um, yeah. And so I think, the, you know, the biggest thing right now is we don't know who we're reaching out to who really needs it at this point. Yeah, um, my guess is there's probably more students that because of their circumstances aren't able to uh, get the, the, the benefit of what you're offering. Um, you know, we've seen some parallels um, in Mecklenburg County schools too, where there's a lot of kids that are disenfranchised, don't have the technology. So that sort of stands to reason that it cascades uh, through all the way through. Uh, it's been fascinating. Uh, it, you've been there uh, 17 years now. Uh, and, uh, you know, I think uh, one of the things I know about CPCC is the partnership they've had with the community. And uh, I really love that about what you guys do as part of your mission. Um, why have you stayed so long? Uh, that's a, it's an interesting story in, this, in today's age where you've got CIOs coming and going so quickly in and out of organizations. What, what's kept you there? I will tell you that uh, Central Piedmont, one of the things I've shared, I mean, one of the things I really enjoy doing there is that when we have new employee orientation and the cabinet members uh, have the opportunity to do uh, a welcome to all our staff and all of us will say the same thing, um, is that we love the passion that we have at the institution and we love serving our community. I think our president, Dr. Diemari, uh, really puts it blessed when she said that we are in the life transformation business. And so, I've always stated that I want to be where I can make a difference. And when you hear something like we're in the life transformation business, when I believe that we're making a difference, that's where I want to be. And so I can use the skill sets I have, whether it be technology or whatever I can offer, I love being there. So that, that's fantastic. It's amazing. And I think there's this um, movement that I've been following um, kind of started with the Conscious Capitalism uh, book that has been out now for a bunch of years. But there's this whole movement around purpose and companies sort of adopting purpose. And what I think it is interesting is that CPCC has had that purpose statement in changing people's lives and enhancing their lives. And that's the thing that I really admire about what you guys do. And I can understand why you're there. Um, and when I, you know, it's, it's your mission so clear uh, and you're really contributing to the community. I really admire that. Uh, unfortunately, uh, uh, David and Mike, I have to jump off and I'm going to let Mike take it from here. But um, I'm part, as I mentioned, the BRM Institute's got their annual conference and I'm, I'm due up to be uh, on stage with those guys here right now, right about now. So I apologize to everyone. Enjoy the conversation and I'll catch up with you very soon. Oh, thank you, Joe. Appreciate right. it. Take care. Thank you, Joe. So with that, um, you know, talk about transition, um, you know, for Charlotte, right? Um, where, where do you, see, you know, you've been there for 17 years, right? What what was kind of the current state and what's, what's the future state of, of Charlotte from, from, you know, of technology in regards to resources and education? Um, and the reason why I want to ask that question is uh, over the last couple of years, I noticed that there was a gap in cybersecurity, um, which goes back to kind of data analytics, right? And, and tool sets and, and, and being prepared. So are there any stories there in regards to either technology or opportunities where, you know, you've been able to help, um, you know, draft uh, new positions or new roles, whether that's an IT or just just using data, right? So, yeah, that's, so that's a fascinating thing. Um, so, there's a lot of things that I can uh, speak about that in terms of uh, data. Um, so, we have been really focused on data analytics. You know, everyone's talking about being data driven as an organization, and um, I would say that one thing I would share is that that's that data in itself is something that I, I like to make the differentiation between data and information, right? You can always find data to kind of, uh, uh, kind of help with your theory that you may have. It's another to say, let's look at the data to find out what's really happening underneath all of that, you know, the work that you're doing. And so I think uh, one of the things that, in terms of what you said is, is position is that uh, we've created a new position, I want to say about a year, maybe two years ago, when it, focusing on that and tying it to strategic work, right? And so we want to make sure that we are looking at all our data sets in terms of uh, whether it be our students, whether it be, as I mentioned, about the community, and then pulling that together, and then defining our strategic goals as a result of that. Um, sometimes we kind of take it the reverse, right? You take the strategic goal and look for the data set. And so that, that's been fascinating. 
Um, I will say that in the IT industry, I, what I'm interested though is about, um, so when you talk about data, I also start to quickly think about artificial intelligence and machine learning. Yeah. And so for me, I, that I start to, there's the, there's the marketing <laughs> people that are out there. Right. And there's, yeah, I've seen people say, Oh, that's AI. I'm like, that's not AI. <laughs> you know, that's, that's you putting marketing on it. But you know, how would, I guess, where's, where's your de definition of, of AI? Well, for me, I think the focus lately has been about machine learning, right? So it's about really giving a system, whether, uh, you know, all the data set and finding a lot of uh, similarities, right? Uh, and correlations with the data and trying to figure that out. So what's fascinating, I think uh, many of us have looked and probably we dabble into what they call chatbots, where it's able to look at all the data sets, whether it be in, in the help desk and seeing all the customer questions, all the answers, uh, crawling through your website, and then trying to pull together some, uh, some similarities and correlations and then offering up what that means, right? But that's what I was trying to say. There's a difference between data and information. Someone still needs to really interpret what comes out of that, right? So statistician would say, Right, correlation does not equate uh, to causation, right? And so there's someone still error. needs there's to evaluate that information. too, right? There's five percent rules. Uh, absolutely, and, absolutely. So that, that's where I was going to because it's about the ethics, right? So now we need to talk about okay, what do you do with that information? Uh, I'm still a firm believer. Maybe we'll be at a place where you can trust the AI <laughs> and the ML, but right now it really should be to to really provide information and then inform us and then we still need to make some decisions, right? And so kind of like what we discussed early on, um, when we have parents and students who call in and say, hey, I, I need to know whether there are jobs out there and here are my interests and it would be great, like it can kind of take some of your information and kind of direct you and guide you into a direction and how you, you know, uh, take courses and all those things. but we don't want to be a place where it kind of discourages you simply because of the way that you answer, right? Uh, in AI, there's a concern uh, about intrinsic bias because, uh, as I said before, it's going to take all the information about all the questions and how most of, of us have answered. Well, we've answered in a biased way, and so it's going to repeat that bias as well, Built too. So we've got to be very careful. Well, yeah, exactly. And so the ethical di uh, dilemma is something that we need to be careful about. So uh, I think for me, it's a specific tied to higher education. I think uh, one of the things that I think is uh, just transforming that I want to really have further conversations, we're not completely there, is that I'm not sure if you heard the flipped classroom model before. No. Can you share that? Okay. So, uh, yes, certainly. So. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with the little house in the prairie. <laughs> yes. Yep. Uh, show. And so uh, if you think about that show and you remember the classroom setting, it's amazing how, if you look at today's classroom setting, uh, very much similar, right? So, and, and that's back in the 1870s. So if you think about it, you know, we're talking about, you know, 130, 150 years where the model of the actual physical classroom setting hasn't changed much. So, What's interesting about the flipped classroom model is the idea is that if you think about traditional classes today, you sit in a classroom, you have someone giving the lecture, and the whole idea is that lecture is at the same pace of everything for everybody. Yeah. So you're hoping that the students, let's say there's 30 students in there, is that they will learn at the same pace. And then what they do is they go home and they do something called homework, and um, if they got the lecture, they'll do well. But when they don't, they start to struggle. But the lesson plan has been designed from week to week, and it's th the professor's going to stay on task with that. If a student starts to fall behind, typically they would say, you need to go to a tutor, right? Yeah. The flip classroom model is to think of it in the reverse now. So think about it in the sense of, okay, well, you could do the lecture at home now. Uh, let's say if it's a recording, you can always replay it if you don't get it. And then when you come to class, now you're doing the practical self, the practical uh, part of it. And if you're struggling, you can either have your peers to assist you or you can have the, the professor to assist you there. 
to kind of solidify and reinforce what you've learned. Let me ask you this. And so, so if they're I, if they're doing testing electronically, is is there a place for machine learning to know why you're missing? You know, is there any way, is there any analytics to say, hey, is there a correlation there potentially to help people that truly want to learn? Let's say they're not just answering numbers because they don't care or, 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 you know, what, you know, they haven't put that time in. Let's just, you know, make, if you, if we make the assumption that the student is passionate, they've made, they've went all the classes and they've done their, their effort. Is there a way that machine learning could potentially help if there's a learning style change, right? I don't know if that stuff's out there today or not. I mean, yeah, you, you really, you're getting to that place now. So it's called adaptive learning. So again, it's really about, trying to uh, really focus on the student. It's really putting the student at the center of everything, including teaching and learning. And so we wanna be at a place where, hey, uh, everyone is going to do well in certain skills and then struggle in other skills. But instead of putting them through the same pace, how about in those particular that you're struggling with, uh, focus on the lecture in that regards, and then those that you're, that you're already familiar with, let you go ahead and move through that. So adaptive learning is, is using like machine learning, for instance, to kind of get a sense of where you're excelling in certain skills or lessons in certain areas that you're struggling with and give you more lessons when you need it and just only cover the areas where you don't need it so that no, you know how it is when when you already know it, you get bored and you don't want you want to move on, but you can't because you. And so yeah. adaptive learning, I think technology is now giving us an opportunity to kind of personalize the learning experience for those particular students. I think it's really exciting because I go back to college and I go back to high school, uh, especially high school where we had one one teacher um, who was uh, a chemistry teacher and. I think if everybody took that class, they'd be excited about going to school. I mean, there's people that were seniors that want to go back to be a be freshman and sophomore because they wanted to take this professor, this this teacher, just because they were just so dynamic. And, you know, it just, again, you just don't have that everywhere. Is there a way to kind of clone that? Or maybe that could be a threat to teaching though too, right? And so are you seeing the flip side with your professors and your teachers of if their students are getting something, is there a way to coach them up too? Or to figure out their styles. Yeah, so that, you know, it, it, that's always a challenge because, uh, you know, it, sometimes people feel that it's a threat, right? So uh, to the instructors, but to be honest with you, I think, you know, I think instructors are, are heroes. If you really think about what they do, people really kind of think they're there just to instruct, but they're far more than teachers, right? It's not about passing on knowledge. It's really coaching them about giving them wisdom. It's not taking, giving them intelligence, but how do you take that and, and apply to life and, and work skills? And then it's, it's about, um, you know, sometimes a lot of times people are struggling. And so a lot of our professors are about figuring out where they are and then helping them through that. And so uh, if you only kind of narrow down everything to just teaching, then yes, you're right. They're threatened by that. But I think if we start to understand the role of the instructor is far beyond that, um, coach and supporter, cheerleader, you name it. They do a whole lot of things. Uh, I think that's the difference. Um, and so I think there's a space, I think that's true with all industries, right? So there is a space where a lot of these technology is may replace some things, but it allows them to really focus on some of the passions, really reaching to the individual's students and helping them out on their specific needs versus focusing on, oh, yes, I need to help you in that again or again, or no, I need to move off. I think it just allows them to really focus on the students. I think that not only excites the, the instructors, it excites the students when they feel like the instructor cares for them. I mean, they do that now, but now focusing on them specifically. So is there any, any technologies or strategies that you look back over the last you know, five to 10 years that maybe it surprised you? that you picked it or maybe, Hey, I'm glad, you know, I'm glad we did pick this, this, this technology or this strategy. So what, any surprises out there in regards to some of the technologies that uh, maybe you might've passed on, but you're kind of glad that, wow, Hey, I'm glad, glad we did this for, for the university or for the faculty or for, you know, alumni. You know, there's all, always a lot of these trends that, that show up. Um, um, so, um, 
you know, I was looking at some point blockchain, for instance, it's still very hot, high on the list. And, you know, it was related to AI ML. Uh, there's a lot of those things that I think it's less about um, whether it be a surprise. It's so much when to get involved with it. Um, I think the balance for me has always been figuring out when is it appropriate um, for this particular industry, especially higher education, to adopt certain things. Some things we want to adopt earlier than others, but there are some things that we probably should pause and just just let the industry go forth first and see how how we need to adopt it at, at our institution. Um, one thing that I've been excited about, it's kind of we talked about a little about nurses, is that it's incredible how um, any of these industries, but one of the things I saw was uh, uh, recently, uh, not recently, but uh, uh, a mannequins, I don't want to call it this, but the, they're called Sims. And it, it, it's really about um, just not only replicating the, the hospitals, but also uh, an individual. So uh, they, they uh, give students the ability to be able to either administer certain drugs or take the blood pressure and all those things, um, but it, it really gives you feedback. So an instructor will be behind the scenes and they will either accelerate the heart or say, I'm in pain. It really gives the students the experience, but do it in a very safe environment where it's not done to a real patient. And so seeing some of those technology, I think is really incredible. And I hope we can adopt some of those things further on so that it gives students the hands-on experience, but yet in a safe environment. And I think we're gonna see more and more of those things, whether it be in the automobile industry uh, and so forth. In regards to leadership, right, from where you, from where you stand, um, you know, this, the CIO, you know, three to five years, and again, this is just from, from, from my pane of glass, I, you know, I've seen some folks uh, over the last couple of years, some organizations where, you know, that, that role has changed or, you know, it's not been replaced um, as, as an outsider, you know, with things kind of being as a service, um, you know, how, how, has, how has that model uh, changed or impacted, you know, how you make decisions and, and, and how you help, you um, you know, higher education, because again, there's, there's a lot of choices out there, right? Because there's so many things that are now mature and everything seems to be as a service and there's folks that can go out and can pick it, pick it up. And then all of a sudden you're like, wait a second, how did, how did these folks get this? So, you know, what's, what's, you know, as you look at things, how are, how do you, how do you select the right technologies and, you know, how, do, you know, what, what, what do you think the future is? Yeah, so I, I think there's two parts to that. One is, uh, you know, the consumerization of IT. I think uh, technology has evolved, right? So technology used to be something that was uh, probably more sophisticated and some of the, the sexy things or the mo most innovative things are at the, uh, the corporate level or the enterprise level or even at the government level. But we're finding ourselves uh, in the last several years where it's in the hands of the users. And so now we're seeing users who have a different expectation of the companies, right? So these mobile devices have now really driven uh, co uh, companies to rethink how they, they serve their, their consumers. And so uh, the consumerization of IT has really kind of shifted how we prioritize and how we serve our, our, our customers. Um, from a CIO perspective, I would say that one of the things you're right, I mean, there has been a lot of uh, standardization and maturity uh, but I think, for instance, uh, in higher education specifically, one of the things, if you may remember when you went to, to college, uh, if you may have a slip of paper and, and you had to go to the admissions office and then maybe to the financial office, aid office, and then you had to go to the cashier office and, and you had to pay and, and then maybe talk to, the, um, to a professor or someone. But you were, uh, had to go to each of these offices. And so now the whole idea, again, is to put the student at the center at it. And so how do we bring the service to them? So what we're saying is, how do we serve the students holistically? So now we need to really, uh, whether I'm an instructor, whether I'm the financial aid person, we need to understand where that student is so that we are helping them. Because the last thing we want to do is bounce that student from one place to the other. Oh, wait. You, you can't pay yet because you got to take care of something else. And so the students get bounced around a few times. But now if we see the whole of that student and see that information, now we can serve them better. Say, and, and they're the central part of that. 
And so where I go with that is that you're right. So there's a lot of maturity in the industry, whether it be how we serve in terms of payments or whether uh, collecting information. What I'm seeing our role is really we become the integrators of all that, right? So how do we get all that data set and, and really provide it to our um, organization so that they're serving that students holistically? Um, and so it's important for us to kind of understand that, that uh, the, the technologies around it and then pull it all together so that we can help that particular student. And so I think one of the things I keep saying is that we've been in, a, in an interesting space, right? So as technologists or CIOs, we've been had a bird's eye view. We've been serving each individual area as well, but now we, we are looking to break down the walls and, and, and and pull it all together. And so we become the integrator. So we're integrating businesses, not just technology. We have to be more business minded as well too, to, to see how we serve that student from the point that they are interested to the point that they get a career, a job or a career. Yeah, no, that's the cool part too, is you know, by default, people have to use technology, right? So for better or for worse, you know, it's kind of the, kind of the heyday. So I guess kind of to wrap things up in regards to, is there a certain project or a student or faculty that, you know, again, might not be out, might not be out in the public, but maybe a favorite story that, uh, you know, kind of shines light on the success of CPCC and, and some of the, the faculty or staff or, or students, um, what they've done at, in the community or nationally or internationally that people may not be as aware of. Uh, there's a lot of those stories. I, I would say probably the one that uh, that's very related to technology that, uh, that especially as it relates to where we are with COVID and all that is that uh, we've been looking at a technology. Um, you know, one of the hardest things about is, is, is communication, right? So how do we engage our students um, at a level uh, virtually, right? So there are ways to do that, right? So we can ask questions and all that. But there is an interesting product out there and that we've actually piloted that really takes it to another level where it's not just asking the question so that you get a simple yes or no, right? So it, it really kind of uses, again, AI ML, for instance, yeah. that will actually help students to formulate questions that will have further inquiry, for instance. And, and so what it does is it really helps to uh, formulate the not just the questions but then students are able to respond uh, that really takes a dialogue and so instead of uh you know the, the previously we will use announcements and so i i would say mike here's a question and you say yeah that's a great idea and then the, and, you know the story ends right? i'm not sure how it is it's kind of like a a family dinner conversation like a parent like a father who says how was your day and the child goes it was great and, yeah, and that's the end of the conversation, yeah. <laughs> right? So, you know, how, how do you how do you change the question uh, so that it, the, the 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 child responds and then and then then it provokes a question and it, it continues? And so AI ML has has played a part in that kind of chat situation. And so uh, we had one uh, nursing area who talked about this, and what, what was interesting is that she said that as this was being used, uh, it was incredible to see the dialogue that, that students were having, but uh, because it really also brought conversation that was related to current events, but then they start talking and pulling information about what, where they are and current events that, she said that she's learning from the process as well too about new ideas and, new thoughts that were considered because when you start to see dialogue that really starts to take grassroots efforts and then it just just continues to form you you'll be amazed by where it goes and so that's just a glimpse of the possibilities that we can have as a result of it so i was excited about how these students were uh coming up with ideas and thoughts thoughts and questions that we would have never have seen as a result of it. And ho hopefully if that continues on, uh, if you can build on it, maybe you start to find answers to some of the society questions that has been going long um, that without an answer that we might be able to spark answers as a result. Yeah, commonality, but like we said with data and privacy, 
crossing that chasm of, but you know, if I know that you're into cars, it might be weird saying, oh, wow, it's not, you got that, you know, again, I'm just making up, you got this uh, Corvette, you know, 1963 Corvette. That's awesome. You have that. Wait, wait, wait a second. How did you know I have a 19, but you're right. It's commonality and kind of how do you build rapport, right? So that's, that's pretty cool. Well, David, I, I, you know, for me and Joe, we can't thank you enough for, for being on the show. This is kind of the, the part of the show where, you know, we let you kind of plug or, or represent anything that you like to do, whether that's, you know, locally in the community or with, with CPCC uh, or, you know, professionally. So is there anything that you'd like to, to share with, with our listeners about, uh, you know, about David Kim and things that you'd like to, to reference? Well, uh, you know, I, it's less about David Kim. As I said earlier, I love what I do at Central Piedmont, and I love the mission and vision of Central Piedmont as well, too. I know that we are all in this situation called COVID, and it, it, it can be daunting. And uh, I know it's challenging. Um, I know that, again, here in the Charlotte area, that uh, many people are challenged and focus on uh, the fact that how they have their children who is now with CMS or somewhere else where they have to figure out how to help their children, and that's changed how they, uh, their family situation, their work environment, and all those things as well, too. And so I know that it has added additional stress. What I want to say is that Central Piedmont, we, we have a lot of flexibility, and we offer a lot of opportunities, including uh, whether it be scholarships, and then, as I mentioned earlier, we're offering technologies, so that's what's needed. We're trying to do our very best to, to break down barriers. Uh, and so one thing I want to let people know is that it's never too late. Uh, we have still what we call second short sessions. And so I know that people say, well, there's no way I can, I, I can attend the class. I would say, please reach out. Reach out to the college and let us help you. We have, uh, we, we have a wonderful program called Single Stop that we, I, I'm not sure if I mentioned this earlier, but uh, we can even help with um, – whether it be filling out your tax form so that you can get financial aid assistance and all that. Oh, wow. uh, perhaps uh, we have food pantry, for instance, because you know that, that's a barrier as well too. So we recognize many barriers and COVID is not, not a, well, it's a new thing, but the whole barrier situation is not new to us. And so we wanna work with anybody and everybody. And so if there's a desire, call us and let us give you uh, have an opportunity to discuss what that may be and help you figure out ways in which we can get you to a class and, and help um, take you to your next journey yeah, whether it be a career locally, whether it be basket weaving that's great uh, now we'll put that in the show notes too i was talking with somebody i believe uh, cbc has some sort of partnership or something with with folks with with autism as well helping them get those life skills to so that they can um you know, be prepared for, for certain jobs. So is, is, is that program still, still around or, you know? I, I unfortunately don't know that, but I wouldn't be surprised. Um, so there are a lot of those things that we recognize and we will help with. So, um, I, I need to find that out because I didn't know that specifically. Well, I think that's the reason why, right? You guys have so many great programs and it just takes Hey, just go take a look at it, right? And if you're kind of afraid about time and money, you know, the, you know, CPC will ha have have the resources to help you try to find that money if they can, right? So, um, no, that's great. I, I can't thank thank you enough for being on the show and you know CPCC as well for everything that that you and uh, and CPC do in the community. So, thank you so much, David, and uh, I hope you have a great week. Thank you very much, and you as well. Take care. Take care.